Hi, welcome to Yul Soy. We're here downtown Fresno at CMAC. We'd love you to come down and take a tour. Collins, founder of Yo Soy Media Inc. and my uh, social enterprise is YoSoyCentralCal.com. Uh, today we are honoring uh, Older Americans Month and we have um, detective, elder abuse detective Skip Swain. I'm going to take two seconds. Can you reintroduce? We have a new sure. member. My name is Erin Roberts. I'm a community member here in Fresno. And uh, Vanoush Ketchadoran is uh, now uh, her last day is the end of the month. Um, anyway, today we want to go ahead and this is Go ahead and introduce yourself. My name's Detective Skip Swain. I'm with Fresno County Sheriff's Elder Abuse Unit. And uh, for the last almost nine years, I have been um, uh, assigned to elder abuse investigations okay. here in Fresno County. So can you can you give us a little background? Are you uh, homegrown? Are you here in Fresno all your life? or? I am not. I, uh, I've been in Fresno for about 17 years. I'm in my 27th year in law enforcement. Um, and uh, I work for a smaller agency up north, but uh, for the last 17 years I've been here in Fresno. Okay, wait, up north how far? San Francisco uh, or? Mariposa area. Oh, Mariposa? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's still part of our group, pretty Southside much. Yosemite National Park. <laughs> oh, that was a nice little stay, huh? Um, so, now you say you were, you've been here on the Elder, kind of give us an idea how you got into this specialty area. Okay, so, um, there are different uh, assignments within the Sheriff's Department. Um, there's a patrol assignment and from patrol there are separate uh, units that investigate different uh, areas of crime, mm -hmm. whether it be the Ag Task Force crimes, gang crimes, uh, persons crimes, property robbery crimes, um, and uh, I'm in the persons crimes unit, the abuse unit, and within that unit there's domestic violence, there's child abuse, there's yep. uh, sex crimes, there's uh, missing persons, there's a yeah. number of, of crimes that involve people being the victim. Okay. And within that, uh, elder abuse yeah. is a specialty investigation area. Okay, so when you transferred here or became part of the staff here, you were already doing people crimes? No. Uh, I, I have a background um, in my law enforcement career. Uh, I've always been in the field. Um, I've done a lot of different uh, assignments. Uh, patrol, as, as a patrolman, um, yeah. I have worked um, child abuse before. Um, okay. I was a school resource officer. Uh, okay. I've done a lot of different areas in, in law enforcement. Um, and uh, nine years ago, I applied for the elder abuse position. Okay. So in other words, it kind of built up to this, and uh, being and dealing with a lot of different people crimes. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm hearing it's kind of a specialty area, and you're dealing with uh, folks that perhaps, uh, like in my mother's case, have se severe dementia, so they're constantly confused. I deal with crimes against people over the age of 65 uh, where the suspect knew or reasonably should have known that they were 65 and older. I do physical abuse investigations, financial abuse investigations, uh, caregiver neglect investigations, and uh, elder death investigations also. Um, and I also investigate crimes against the dependent adults, which would uh, include anyone who has some of their activities of daily living somehow restricted, so intellectually disabled folks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you give us an example of a scenario that someone might encounter that is an example of financial? Right now, we see about 90% of our um, suspects or alleged abusers, if you will, uh, being family members, um, whether it be through identity theft, um, you know, on the financial end of things, or when somebody has lacks capacity and um, is taken advantage of and all of a sudden their money is being used in other places. Um, so let's just give an example of um, recently 
we've had some caregiver neglect cases where we have a caregiver who's being paid to take care of a loved one and that loved one requires a higher level of care than they're either able to or uh, willing to provide and that person becomes a meal ticket and they end up in the hospital let's say with an altered level of consciousness they go to the hospital and all of a sudden they have um, severe decubitus ulcers or bed sores if you will um, malnourished dirty this is so this is really sad we yeah. see we see some of that um, we also see the the theft from our elders um, so, so if someone suspects elder abuse what do they do yeah well there's two there's two things they can contact adult protective services okay. and they can report that uh, through Adult Protective Services and Adult Protective Services does uh, their investigation and if they confirm um, that there is in fact uh, abuse involved then they report that cross report that to law enforcement uh, or they can contact your local law enforcement agency um, and report it through a dispatch where an officer will be dispatched to the scene and do an investigation and then if that investigation needs further follow-up that that um, case would then be forwarded myself as a detective or to the detective that's working within that investigational jurisdiction now what I've learned now that I'm going through this experience is that there are uh, checkpoints like for example the bank they have the right to report if something looks suspicious not only do they have the right they're mandated to mm -hmm. report okay. uh, suspected elder abuse financial. Okay. Uh, they are mandated to report that and that uh, came about in 2010. So if the bank suspects uh, elder abuse, they're mandated reporters. Okay. And, and then you have, on the physical end of things, you have, um, or neglect end of things, you have all of your healthcare workers are, are mandated reporters. Oh, okay. So if you're a nurse, a doctor. Right. So if someone comes into the ER with an unexplainable injury uh, and it doesn't appear to be consistent with their story and they suspect that they may be a victim of abuse, they would contact law enforcement. Or if they come in in such a state of neglect, they would then also contact Adult Protective Services and law enforcement. So what qualifies neglect exactly? Um, a condition where it doesn't appear that they have received the uh, standard and quality of care that they have needed. So if someone comes in, for example, with decubitus ulcers um, and they're dirty and disheveled and they learn that they're being cared for by someone else, then that would be a call that would be made to law enforcement and adult protective services. Okay, and so can you give us other examples that we probably wouldn't even think to ask that you've seen we deal a lot with scams um, where it's an outsider, uh, international lottery scams specifically, where um, an elder gets a phone call, says you've won $18 million, um, congratulations, it's the, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll legitimize it with something that everyone knows, uh, Publishers Clearinghouse, or the Mega Millions Lottery, something, and a lot of elders have played the Publishers Clearinghouse, and they, remember that and so they're like congratulations you've won we need to get you your prize but to do that we need to go through the the processing and um, there's a fee and we're going to need you to um, come up with fifteen hundred dollars let's say and and to do that we need you to you know go put fifteen hundred dollars um, on a, a green dot money pack card or through Western Union, we need that $1,500. And if an elder says, why, well, I, I don't have $1,500. Well, how much do you have? And, and uh, so it starts there and all of a sudden, once they're on the hook, they need more and they need more and they need more and they need more. And what elders don't understand is um, a lottery or a sweepstakes cannot charge you a fee. There's, wow. there's no fee involved. But unfortunately, not everyone understands that, especially if you deal with somebody on the other end of the phone who has maybe a diminished capacity mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. they live alone and maybe their neighbors and loved ones haven't realized that they have that diminished capacity. So that 
in and of itself uh, breeds further problems for them. And once they're into them, then they don't want to back off because they know that that, that money is going to it's be a coming. Regular paycheck. And they'll keep going with this, um, with this, with this scam. Um, we also have the grandparent scams where someone calls up, they know the name of the grandchild, they can get it through various ways. Social media is one of them. Um, they know the grandchild's name, grandma, grandma, do you know who this is? Sometimes they don't. And grandma's like, Tommy? Yes, Tommy, I'm in a lot of trouble. I've been arrested in Mexico and I, 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 need, I need to pay a fine. And all of a sudden they're wiring money. Um, that and, and Tommy will hand the phone to somebody who acts as an official and the official will say, you cannot tell anybody about this. If it does, we're gonna charge more, this or that. And that scam just keeps going. So actually that is the grandchild that's involved. It is not the grandchild they, that's they're, involved. They're not. They play so upon, playing on, it's play all, upon okay. their emotions. It uh, is so all a scam. I guess what I took away from that is we should never be giving money to get money. Never give money to get money. And then we should not be giving out our personal information we online do. or over the over the phone when someone calls. That is correct, especially mm -hmm. if it's a financial institution that's calling saying, this is your bank. Yeah. They have all of your information. We don't need to be giving them any, uh, any okay. information at all. Um, that is very typical. Uh, we're also seeing now computer intrusion cases where they call up and say that they're with a well-known company, say Microsoft. Yes. Um, and uh, they're going to update, they have to update their computer and they get the elder to key them into their computer. Uh, and they are then into their bank into accounts. Into their bank accounts. And whatever else. And they can then wire money to themselves from that area. We've had, um, I've heard of uh, cases where calling and saying we're, th we're with Windows. Well, yeah. Windows isn't a company. Right. But <laughs> Windows is very common. Right, so, right. And right. if you're not and technologically right. savvy, you may not be familiar with the names of the computer systems. Right. So we deal with people who are not tech savvy, right. but have technology. Right. And we also deal with people who are very trusting. And this generation is very trusting. Yes. And they wouldn't think that somebody would be able to call them up and and scam them, and that's the last thing they're worried about. Um, but so it happens. So being cautious, making sure we're always cautious <laughs> with so our would, interactions. So what would you suggest, I mean, uh, to combat this as, an, as a daughter to an older adult that has some of those items? Should we kind of start uh, testing them or making them aware of this ahead of time instead of after it's Education Start, right, is right. is key. Education mm -hmm. is key. If we if we remind our elders, please do not give out your personal information. If it's your bank calling, they have your information. Do not give them your information. Um, there are there are many ways that um, it seems there's a scam of the day. If there's a way for somebody to get money and they know that um, our elders are the ones that hold the wealth within America. Mm -hmm. uh, the last figure I heard was a $1.7 billion loss uh, last year. Wow. From elder abuse? Wow. wow. From elders. <laughs> and here's, here's the thing. We have one in 14 elders say that they have be been the victim of, of abuse. Now we're not quantifying what type of abuse that is. Right. But one in 10 in a survey says they're a victim of abuse, but only one in 14 report. Wow. So we're getting 7%, a little more than 7% Why is of that? elder abuse reports. Well, there's a lot of reasons. Okay. One is shame and embarrassment. Shame and embarrassment of being that victim. The other thing is, is because a lot of the abusers are um, a dependent and that relationship is very codependent. Um, I need my mom so that I have a place to be and my mom needs me for her independence. So it's a codependent. It, and so she would rather, or he would rather put up with some abuse rather than the alternative, which would be, do you wanna go to a home? No, I don't wanna go to a home, this is my home, right? Right. But so, right. Oftentimes an elder needs that, that uh, alleged abuser 
to keep their independence. Okay, so it sounds to me like, I mean, our, our entire population and how we do business even at home is changing. So would it be best to say that perhaps we should start at the front end when you're still in college to have some college courses or something, or maybe community outreach of some sort? Or? Awareness. And, you know, oftentimes I, I speak to elders that say, I, I just hang up on those people, and that's great. The problem is, is that there are those that don't hang up on those people. And I say this, a bad fisherman will catch a fish if he throws the line out long enough and is persistent enough. Right. And a blind squirrel will find a nut. Yes. And so these robocalls that we're experiencing, you know, it's m much more sophisticated than any of us really mm. realize. I heard a new one the other day where if it's a number that calls you and you call it back and it charges you and that's how they make money off oh of it. Oh my God. Yes. Because whether you answer or not, you're gonna call back to see who called you. Interesting. Yep, so that's another way they get you. I got an email the other day, um, my church here in Fresno, uh, they were warning us that people are using the pastor's name and associating with email accounts and then sending emails asking for gift cards. Oh my God. Oftentimes, um, police agencies, service agencies are, are used in the scam process. People call up and identify themselves as with one agency or another and get your credit card over the phone and you're going to give a donation and all of a sudden they're off and running with, with your right. So it sounds like we just need to not give our information over the phone regardless of whether you're older or not, just don't do it. Unfortunately, we are in that in that time where we cannot be giving out personal okay. information. So I have one question here. Um, my concern, I, I realize you gave us statistics for all across the U.S. In our area here, what are the most, the give us number one, number two, and number three crimes against elders in our area, Central California? I think it runs the same nationwide. Yeah. We're, okay. our, our, our largest crime against elders is financial abuse mm -hmm. and financial exploitation. Uh, most often um, that is by a family member, okay. um, whether it be um, through you, the use of a power of attorney, mm -hmm or uh, someone who has, say, a diminished capacity, but is still trusting. Um, what we see a lot right now is people's um, bodies outliving their brains. And with that uh, is not a lot of medical care because we don't need the medical care, but we see the diminishing capacity, but still good health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a recipe for exploitation, yeah. especially if you have a child who wants their mother or father to change their will or trust, um, or to sign a grant deed for their home. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, as a parent, you trust, trust your child. And mm -hmm. when your child says, mom, we need to sign this here, and we bring a notary public in, the notary public's job, only job is to assess identity. They're not mm -hmm. to assess capacity. So we don't know what the capacity of that person is signing it. And it can be years later that we find out that their grant deed for their home has been signed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what are we going to do? I was reading a few statistics. I may not have them spot on, but right now we have 170% point, what, 170.8% of our population here just in our Central Valley that's over the age of 50. You're one individual that's, that's handling these cases. I would imagine that your caseload is rather high. I get about 140 cases assigned to me each year. Okay. And those can, those can range, uh, right now um, we have a case that we're investigating where a daughter um, was named trustee, took over the trust early, and has exploited the trust um, almost three million dollars. Oh, so, but that's, I mean, three hundred dollars could be a life savings. Right. Right. So we treat each case um, with the same importance 
Right. So there's not right. a dollar amount you wouldn't investigate. I do not have a um, an investigational threshold. I do not. Right, right. A crime is a crime, pretty so. much. But my 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 curious question is, as as our population, as as we see every day, license plates are coming in from New York, Idaho. I mean, we're just getting a lot more people coming into the Central California area. What? Do you what would you like to see in the very short term since you're still in charge or still dealing with these type of cases? How would you like to see that department evolve if you could? Um, I think that it's that it's uh, it's time that agencies work together. I am co-located um, here in the senior resource center with adult protective services, the ombudsman, the public guardian's office in-home supportive services, older adult mental health. Um, there are not very many centers like we have here in Fresno. We're very lucky. I have traveled um, quite a bit um, and other people are jealous of what we have here in Fresno. I think that that needs to be expanded upon. I would like to see at some point um, a, an elder task force where you have multiple agencies assigned to one team and everyone works on the investigations no matter the jurisdiction um, because it really does take, uh, it takes a group to investigate, um, but not only investigate, but also to um, do some preventative work and, and also the aftercare mm -hmm. um, of these victims so, you know, we have our own elder advocates or elder victim advocates. Um, and I think that, that that can be built into a more of a team concept than we have going right now. And I'd like to see that in the future. However, you, don't ha you have a lot of grant monies out there for a lot of different things. There is no grant, there's grant money for research on elder abuse. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, um, without much research on my end, we have elder abuse present it's growing, the population is growing. The elder population right. is growing. We're calling Huge. it the silver tsunami. Mm -hmm. um, that the baby boomers are becoming 65, I think 10,000 a day mm -hmm. are turning 65. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is growing. There is no monies that are tied to investigation and prosecution of mm -hmm. elder crimes. So my sheriff uh, funds me and allows me to be in the, in the senior resource center mm -hmm. because it's important for our department yes. to invest. Yes, it's important. Things. I mean, they've given, <laughs> I know your time, you've invested into the infrastructure of the city, of the area, so have I. And now Erin is doing her share, so we should be safeguarding these individuals but also I'm hearing that it would be good to have like a little task force to start um, educating people ahead of time ahead of this because I got into it because of what happened to my mother but it's been like a constant like every day is something new and something I have to learn and something I have to a piece of paper I have to go get and it would have been nice to to know hey this is ABC I've gone to now the resource, uh, Valley Resource. They gave a little class the other day. Oh, which, Valley Caregivers Resource. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah was, okay. that was very good. It was very informative because uh, the other component is, um, you know, if you've made too much money and you have it stocked away, we're not going to be able to get any extra help unless you give that back. And into the system, that's what I'm hearing. Otherwise, we, we're not gonna get you extra help. My, one of my aunts might be in that predicament because okay. her husband doesn't look well right now. But I'm just, you know, I'm sure there are many other people that are going through the same situation. So I'm thinking that when you say team, would it be good or advantageous to your department to perhaps put a little core two, three people together to go out into the, to the community and continually uh, inform them to now I do that mm -hmm. I do a lot of elder abuse prevention prevention presentations uh -huh. to different groups uh -huh. um, to different retirement homes um, 
so we are doing that we are educating the mm -hmm. public as much as we can mm -hmm. um, but also you know we have to uh, balance our time with investigations so that we can hold these people accountable mm -hmm. oh god yes 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 so is there a way that we can help or bring volunteers or is there a volunteer mechanism or you know there <coughs> there are um, there are volunteers through the ombudsman I do know that um, but as 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 far as volunteering, you know, in my unit, we don't have that uh, that component set mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a law enforcement agency. We're right. there to investigate um, crimes against our elders and our, our, and our dependent adults. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there was there was grant money out there back several years back for that uh, education and outreach, and there was a person through the Fresno Madera Area Agency on Aging that, mm -hmm. that did that, uh, those presentations. Now, I have carried that on. My department has supported me um, in carrying on the, the prevention talks. So when I'm asked to do them, I, I do do those talks mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and try to get you know, as much information out there as as we can. Right, right. No, I, the sheriff is very sweet. She's a great sheriff. Um, but in my mind, I'm just like, well, do we need to also share that with high schoolers? Do we need to share that with college people? Do we, you know what I'm saying? It What's seems the like- the target audience? Right. I think more like caregivers. Um, anyone who's gonna eventually get, take care of someone yeah. and the family members so they can be on the lookout for these signs and things like that. Yeah, family members, sure, but it sounds, you know, we need to go broader. I, I realize it's, it's always a money thing. We're always restricted to that situation. I'm just in my mind going, okay, how can we help? Maybe we, we can get the mom brigade out and, <laughs> <laughs> and train a few to help. I mean, anything to help because that crime reduction is definitely something that we need that's it goes hand in hand with cost for the community so right yeah so anyway well any other uh, I know that you're gonna have uh, next month a special event at some time we're June 15th is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and uh, there will be an event um, on the 15th uh, I, I will be taking part in that event I am not chairing that event. I, I don't know enough about the event uh -huh. right now. Right. Um, but uh, we will have a panel discussion there. Okay. Yes. I've, I and really I can get you that information as, oh, as yes. soon as as soon as oh. I as soon as I have it. That would be wonderful because we do announcements and we can get it out there. We'll try to help you as much as possible. I. It's just you never you never know how important certain divisions and departments of the PD or sheriff it, are until you start getting involved with the situation. Right. You're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, no one uh, <laughs> really um, looks at elder abuse until they're touched by it and then it becomes very important to them because a lot of people think, gosh, there's elder abuse? People abuse elders? What? And so. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, anyway, there's, are there any, any, uh, anything, anything you want to add to this? I just uh, thanks for letting us get the information out there. And yes, it's wonderful. We want we want to thank uh, Detective Swain very much for coming and taking his time as his day off. As a matter of fact, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. And we hope you, uh, well, it's going to be Mother's Day this weekend. So anyway, just to share, we also want to let you know that Yo Soy has now created Yo Market, and that'll be out at the back of the CMAC building on June 6th will be our first time. And we're looking for vendors. So if you want to come out and share your books, your uh your knitting, quilting, any of those items, look, uh, give me a call at 226-1521 or go on site uh, to the website. It's yosoycentralca.com and there's a flyer there. And also watch Facebook. Um, next week we will hopefully having uh, the convention, oh gosh, Fresno Clovis convention. Uh, they're going to come out and give us a debrief on what's 
what the growth is here locally and bringing in more jobs. So, uh, and then Mickey is helping us in the, <laughs> in the control room, getting all trained or rebrushing up her, her skills. But here's her, her ad uh, from NAACP, um, August 18th through the 25th. This is Jamestown. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, <laughs> um, this is Jamestown. She says there's a join NAACP leaders, members, and partners for a journey from Jamestown, Virginia to Jamestown, Ghana, West Africa to commemorate the year of return. Okay, you can see more of that. And we also highlight the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So that gives you a couple of things coming up here. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, check with Mickey Addison at 559-475-3690. We really appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you next week on Friday. And thank you very much from Yosoy Neighborhoods Fresno. Thank you.